Our expert panelists joining us today are Dr. Richard Palmquist, integrative veterinarian and owner of Sentinella Animal Hospital. He's an author, lecturer, and teacher. Dr. Christina Chambro, internationally known homeopathic veterinarian, lecturer, and teacher. Joan Ranquette, animal communicator, teacher, author, lecturer, and owner of Communication with All Life University. And Brendan Golia, professional pet trainer, behavior expert, and owner of OC Canine Coaching. Welcome to Smart Pet Talk. I'm your host, Anna DeVere. In this special episode, we're excited to be joined by Genesis Rendon. Her journey with animals began long before Genesis could even pronounce their names, but she felt a calling to nurture and care for all animal species. This dedication to animal welfare has guided her over 21 years of experience as a registered veterinary technician specializing in emergency and critical care. In 2012, she was recognized as Vet Tech of the Year for her pursuit of excellence and a commitment to ensuring every pet receives the care they deserve. At the awards ceremony, Genesis had the privilege of sitting next to Dr. Quan Stewart. Little did she know that this chance encounter would change the trajectory of her life. Years later, she would learn of Dr. Quan's Project Street Vet, and she was all in. Together, Dr. Kwan and Genesis provide vital care to pets in underserved communities, on the streets, with an unwavering dedication to ensure that all animals receive the care and compassion they deserve. Today, Project Street Vet is a nationwide movement. Welcome to our show, Genesis. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you guys. It's an honor to have you. I know Dr. Palmquist has a question to open our conversation. Okay. Hi, Genesis. Could you hi. talk about the? Oh, hi. Can you talk about the importance of um, animals to unhomed people? The, well, our main uh, goal, the importance of what we're trying to do with Project Street Vet, is to provide medical attention for the unhoused, uh, to take care of their pet. As we all know, the animal human bond, the animal human bond, is is something that helps us get through our day. So our goal is to keep these pets healthy for them that they can um, keep going and and trying to live a better life. It's not easy to not live in a home with the roof on top of your head. The roof's a little bit different, you know, it's it's tarps and tents, but it helps keep them going. Uh, Another major goal of us is to educate people to not judge and just help because they they do need help. Not every um, person of the unhoused uses their pet to get money. And that's, I think, a big judgment that we all do. I've done it myself. And I'm like, oh, he or she's just using their dog to get money. But myself being out in the streets and helping them has educated us so much that we know they are asking for is going mainly for their pet. Thanks. So what are the some of the ways that you're able to help the unhoused the most? What are the most common, um, the fastest triages, the things that you're able to address the most that has the most impact on the pets and the the people they're with? Believe it or not, the most simplest thing, uh, flea and tick control and vaccines. Hmm. That's what we mainly run into. That's something very hard for them to have access to. And as we all know, flea and tick control is very important even for our pets of us that live Hmm. at a home and vaccines. They are so grateful for that when we are traveling uh, the streets. But we run into everything from uh, dogs giving birth right when we arrive to uh, dental disease or simple allergies, ear infections. But they are so grateful when we ask them, does your dog need or cat uh, flea or tick control or vaccines? And pretty much everyone we run into says yes. And there's some that, um, have they do go to a vet hospital when they get money and they vaccinate their pets. So, and and education as well. We educate everyone that we run into of why spay and neutering is important, getting parvo vaccines since they are living in the street. And we let them know that parvo lives on the ground for a very long time. So we don't just provide medical attention, but we also educate them on how important medical care is. It sounds like you have quite a variety. Do you, can you walk us through what a typical day looks like, like in a little more detail, what it looks like for Project Street Vet? 
a typical day, so it's all volunteer work. Uh, in the beginning, it was just Dr. Kwan and I, and before we both met, he was doing it on his own, and I was mm. doing it on, on my own. But the typical day for us when we get together is we drive all over Skid Row, and we already know where some pet owners go. We have frequent flyers that we visit, but we just drive around. Uh, my car is full of food, blankets, leashes, flea and tick control vaccines, as well as Dr. Kwan. And we just stop with each pet parent that we see and we ask him if they need any medical treatment, any help, if they have any questions, dog or cat food. And we stop and we'll park our cars and then we walk skid row. We, we just walk and it's not a row. A lot of people think it's just a row. It's every street in downtown LA that has- Do you have, do you have a specific route you do and do you see people over and over, do you see the same people? Do you know where people are parked? Yes, uh, we. there's a McDonald's we meet at. So that's where we start our huddle and we get together and we either get in one car or two, depending how many people we wanna meet that day. And we have a route, we have our sixth street, we have Grand, we have seventh. Hugo is someone that we visit frequently. I actually rescued a dog from him named Rain. She was the runt of the litter. Um, his female and male have been spayed and neutered already so that we don't run into her getting pregnant. And um, we have another dog named Bubbles, or is it Popcorn? So uh, <laughs> we have our freaking flyers that we run into. And even people that don't have pets, they always come up to us and they say hello. I think they're just grateful for us being there and helping the community and even giving them a chance for us to talk to. I think a lot of people just don't go up to people of the unhoused to have a conversation with them. And they're very grateful for that because they're human too, just because I'm sorry if I get emotional. It's just, you learn so much for, from them of how they got there and they're human too, and they deserve to not be ignored. So, so actually, oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. Go on, Joan. Oh, I was just going to say we're all going to cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, they, one of the statistics, and I don't know the numbers, is people who take their dogs out for a walk are more likely to have social interactions. And yet the unhoused aren't, we don't necessarily as an average person stop to talk to the unhoused with their animals and what a great opening to it sounds like to make a difference for them would they be at all i don't know nervous like if i weren't there helping with with you where they know who you are if i just saw them with their dog and stopped and said wow you know, look at your dog, what's your dog's name or something like that. Is that something the average person could do to make a difference? Definitely. Uh, the main part on, on your end, if you would go and, you know, take some food is for yourself not to be nervous or scared. We are very careful of who we do approach. There is some pet owners that are protective of themselves and they say, no, we don't need help. Not everyone's nice, but most of the majority they, they are. And just approach them like you would approach you know, any other person, um, ask them how their day is going or just saying hello. Uh, but a lot of them just don't reject our help. There's probably maybe if we visit five people, one person that says, oh, no, I'm OK. I don't I don't need your help. And we leave them alone. And we're like, OK, if, you know, in the future you ever see us walking around, just know that we're here or we let them know that there is a food pantry that we have at a location where, you know, people of the house could go take a shower, brush their teeth. And we have a food pantry there for them to pick up food. So we let them know that that's something that they can do on their own. Excellent. And what about ones that need more um, intensive medical care or surgical care? Do you have relationships with different veterinary clinics in that area? We do. We do. And thank goodness for that. When Dr. Kwan first or I... Do you guys have medication or uh, vaccines that we can buy off you? Or we would call different hospitals to see we have this pet that needs help. Can you help us today? Especially when we run into emergencies. Uh, Beverly Oaks in Los Angeles with Dr. Leash was um, a big support for us. When we would call her, can we use your facility for 
surgeries, which was umbilical hernias. Um, this dog that we was that was pregnant, we had to do an emergency C-section for her, and a pet that we grew very fond of named Um. His owner name is Justin, and uh, he's a traveler. There's a lot of people of the unhoused that like to travel. I mean, they've been all over United States, and uh, we help them with you know flea and tick control vaccines. And one day we were in uh, Studio City, and Justin gives us a call, and he's crying, and he said that he had I'm sorry he got hit by a car, and the car ran over um bag and um the driver took off so we had to go all the way to santa Ana, and you know traffic in los angeles is horrible so when we got there um was on the side and i didn't sound very well dr kwan did too we assessed him so here we call calling dr leach and we go drive back to uh, studio city we um had a broken femur uh collapsed uh, diaphragm so Dr. Pedraza, he's a well-known board certified surgeon. He's mobile and uh, we called him and that was all done pro bono by them, which we're very grateful. But since then, Dr. Kwan and his brother Ian started the nonprofit and with donations, we're able to have any pet parent go to any hospital they're near and wow. we will pay for the surgery, the dental, an exam. And that's all because of donations from all of our supporters, you know, everywhere that knows about Project Street Vet. So it was hard in the beginning, but now <laughs> it's a lot easier. Uh, I travel to hospitals with my with my job. So they'll ask me, hey, Genesis, someone just called, called us that they need help. I said, great, let him in and uh, let her in and uh, put the, the bill on Project Street Vet. So it's a lot of support now, thank you. That's for that. interesting. So it sounds like part of your day is actually doing a lot of promotion and a lot of um, fundraising, or do you have other people on your team that are doing that for you while you're doing the hands-on? Yes, we do have, uh, now we have Danae that helps us coordinate uh, people that call and people that say, hey, we need help. Uh, we ha I have a business card in my car too. So if I see any one of the unhoused, out, uh, unhoused and I'm giving them food, I say, if you need any medical treatment in the future, spay, neuter, dentals, anything, give this number, a, give a call to this number and we'll help you. So we're there for them too. Uh, social media helps a lot. My Instagram, I have a lot of people reaching out like Genesis. We just found a pet parent here in Long Beach or Santa Clarita. So they, they help me kind of get them to a hospital too. That's also very helpful. I'm in Santa Clarita, so the next time you are out here. Great. Um, yeah. Do you do you have a schedule you do? Is there a, do you like say, oh, we're going to this city this day and this area this day, or is it all kind of um, random? It's random. Dr. Kwan lives in San Diego, so he does a lot of work there too. Oh. Uh, we have a lot more volunteers now and doctors. We have doctors starting in New York, I believe, Atlanta. Awesome. that are there and it, it's just random times if i'm traveling for work and i happen to pass skid row i uh, will just stop by drive around i have food again blankets water bowls water in the trunk my trunk and i just pass out pass that out or if i'm in venice i just drive around and i'm always looking every time i'm driving and i see a community of tents if i see a doggy cage or a leash or food that's indication that there's a pet there and i just stop and I ask them if they need anything. So it's pretty much all, you know, all day if I'm on my own. But if Dr. Kwan is coming to town, then we'll get together and we'll spend two, a day or two just in Skid Row or Venice. And uh, we work all day. It's, it's not a, a clinic with their roof over our head at a hospital. Skid Row is our, is our clinic. Do you, are there things that you need? I mean, obviously you need donations of money, but um, are there other things that, that would help your organization? Since I met Dr. Kwan and I'm still asking for this, I would love for us to have a mobile van uh, so that when we are driving in Skid Row, we can um, assess the dog, the dog or cat right then and there. Uh, I have, I walk into hospitals and I have doctors already with, you know, saline, um, antibiotics, ear cleaning. Um, <laughs> I 
Oh my gosh, your dog's so cute. Uh, sorry, <laughs> distracted by others. So we do yeah. have uh, doctors that volunteer. I just got a bunch of uh, trach tubes. Um, we won't need that, but I'm actually going to uh, um, give those to a rescue group called Fix Nation. Uh, it's all volunteer too, where they uh, spay and neuter cats. So I'm going to give them the trach tubes. So anything that we can't use, I'll go give it to a rescue group, and they're very, you know, grateful for that too. How about uh, something I just thought of, or the past five minutes, um, being unhoused? Uh, you know, one of the inconveniences is that you, it's hard to clean yourself and be sanitary. I'm sure a lot of the dogs, while they have flea and tick issues and skin issues, a lot of that can be solved or, I guess, helped by you know a bath. Do you have any services that come along with you? Is that possible? I mean, you know, interacting. Are people comfortable with even doing that? On the like fly, mobile grooming. Yeah, mobile grooming that would you know provide you know some kind of a uh, an, an offering to some to the people who need it the most. I don't know who how dogs on the street um, get cleaned. I know it's not necessary to clean your dogs as much as people think it is in every week <laughs> or two, like in, in most homes. But I imagine there has to be some kind of a sanitary issue that would um, impact the health of the pets on, on the streets. There is uh, a mobile, there's two mobile, I can't remember their name right now, but when we do have pop-ups, uh, we do have a, a mobile group that volunteers their time to, to uh, clip nails. I clip nails too uh, when we go out and uh, they bathe and groom, you know, the dog or cat. So we do have two mobile um, groups that help us when we go. And I think they do it on their own too, where they go and help and, and groom them. But sometimes when we're in Skid Row, you can see one of the uh, fire hydrants that are, you know, broken or they figure out how to use water from that source. And we that see them bathing what there. But I figured, yeah. Yes. Or they, they have a water hose and they find a faucet somewhere. So they do that too. But we, we've seen a few dogs getting, you know, washed at the, uh, the fire hydrant. Not that dogs or cats like getting baths, you know. I wish pickles loved water, but... You know, but that's how that's how they do it. But we do have support with uh, groomers, mobile groomers that help us. And then this might be really Brendan's question, but what about behavior problems in with the animals of the unhoused? I can only imagine. We, we do have a, a few behavioralists that help us. Uh, we always look into um, anyone that's willing to support us. We did have, I don't know, I'm sure if you guys heard of a show called Shelter Me. They did follow us, Dr. Kwan and I, in Skid Row, and we met a lot of people at the premier behavioralists that were there, and they're willing to help. It, it's just, and the main thing about Project Street Vet is getting the word out there so people can learn more about us, and then that's how we can all support each other. But we do have behavioral issues out there. We did have a gentleman, like I said, the, the traveling um, unhoused is teaching their dogs how to walk right by them demands that will help keep their pet next to them. But a lot of the time, these pets are already good with the pet owner because, you know, we all have pets, but we go to work and our pet stays, you know, alone or if they can come to work with us, uh -huh. great. But someone that's unhoused, they don't all get to go yeah, to work. all the time. They're with their dog or cat 24-7, 365. They know everything about this pet. Um, from snoring to walking if they know they're sick because they're with their pet every day. So that's where the pet will learn how to be compliant and know what to do. Sometimes we find those dogs that like to nip, but we, again, it's yeah. all volunteer work. There's so many people that are willing to help us because they see what we're doing out there. Yeah. The so behavior I, I see a lot of is actually resource guarding the owners because the owners are so invaluable to the survival of the dogs and they are with them 24 seven that the dogs are defensive and protective of their owners. Oh, yes. Uh, not too long ago, I was in our districts in downtown LA and I saw a gentleman mm -hmm. laying, you know, on the ground. He was asleep, but his dog was awake and yep. I didn't want to wake him up. So I grabbed one of our Project Street Vet tote bags that comes with a uh, food, water bowl, a food bowl and a toy. And I just grabbed the bag and I left it by the gentleman's, you know, feet. And his pity immediately growled, didn't show me teeth, but let me know, this is my dad, I'm taking care of him, step away. So I just left the food, mm -hmm. 
And when I came back to my car, the gentleman was awake and I let him know that I left the food and he was just, thank you so much. I gave him a business card too, if he needed anything. And I said, you know, your dog, as soon as I came up with his bag of food, she growled at me and, you know, I respected her territory that he let me know that he had just rescued her about three weeks ago. And she just became very protective of him mm -hmm. because they were together every day and, you know, they know the situation that they're in. So we, we do encounter that a lot and we're very respectful of the dog. So luckily we know how to work with them. It sounds like you know how to work with the unhomed and their, their animal companions. And, and it is a, um, it is a, a bit of a complex bond, but I mean, I've, I've done some projects where I've worked with the unhomed and um, I think there are a lot of pet guardians that would want to get involved. Can you imagine what this, where do you want this to go in the future and how can people that might want to have a more hands-on experience or maybe be a part of that daily routine for you? Is there anything on your wish list that would include volunteers in that, in that capacity? Uh, spreading the word um, would be would be a big help uh, so that more of these pets get the best medical treatment that they can possibly get. Even us as pet owners who do have a job and a roof over their head, medical treatment is very, very expensive, as we all know. Let me just put my clothes down if she wants to get out. If It's difficult for us that do have a job to provide medical attention for our pets. It, it's a lot harder for the unhoused. So if the word gets out. Uh, you know, it's okay to give them money. It's okay to give them a bag of food. They're going to be very grateful for this. And I think that's just going to be big, big help and support is to not judge and, and just help them. Even blankets. My friends that have babies will give me their baby blankets. And I gave a gentleman a blanket for his dog. He was outside of the market. And this dog just was so happy with his blanket and another family saw this and I'm like, oh, can they're okay with this? I'm like, most definitely. So she said, oh, I have so many blankets I could donate. I said, even towels will take anything. So I think when people start seeing that, it's when they, they start doing it on their own. And then I bought the gentleman Snickers. He's like, how'd you know this was my favorite candy? I'm like, yeah, it's probably everybody's favorite candy. You can't go wrong with Snickers. And he was just so happy. But I think if more people start seeing it and learning and, podcasts and shows like this, um, that's how we get to spread the word. So it's all, I always say it's like the circle of, you know, rescues and people that do this for animals that helps get the word out. I have a school for, oh. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I have a school for um, animal communication and energy healing. And one of my students once called me and said, I'm sitting at a gas station and there's a whole uh, unhomed person with their, with their dog. And I, I really want to get the dog. And I said, why do you want to get the dog? And she said, Oh, just, you know, what kind of a life does this have this dog have? And I said, um, probably a very rich life with mm -hmm. his person. And she couldn't believe I said that. And then I said, you know, you, you have no business. That's like saying, I want to take his car. I mean, mm -hmm. even worse, I want to take his baby. I mean, it's his family. It, his family, it may be the only thing he has. And he is the only thing that dog has. And that's the best thing those two could have. Most, most definitely. And I, I love that you said that because it's, like I said, it's their lifeline. It's what keeps them going. And, um, you know, um, with Justin, it helped get, get him clean. And uh, again, a lot of the stories that we hear of why, you know, they become unhoused. We had um, a, a lady who her house got burnt in the Santa Clarita fires and mm. she kept her two birds. She was able to save her birds, but she didn't have credit. So she can't get a house. Uh, we had another gentleman that lost everything through a divorce and he also didn't have credit and he couldn't find a home, but his dog Sonny is what got him through. And what started Dr. Kwan Project Street Red or to get out there was uh, he went to a 7-Eleven. I'm not sure if you guys heard this story. And he saw this gentleman, you know, asking for money and Dr. Kwan just, you know, left, kind of ignored him, saw he was there with his dog. But then he went again to the 7-Eleven and he saw the same you know, pet owner that with his dog and dog looked like had flea dermatitis. But uh, when he came out, he 
he came out with a sandwich for the gentleman so the sandwich could eat so the sandwich so the owner can eat and um he took a bite of the sandwich and he gave the rest to his dog so this is why project street is so important and why we shouldn't judge and why we shouldn't want to take the dog or cat away from the owner because they're not doesn't seem like they're giving a, a, a good life they're living a good life um but again it's just to keep you know these pet owners happy and going um mental illness is also a, a big um problem as for us that live in a home you know pickles is my my anxiety dog you know she's here sitting next to me because she knows i'm crying um but we had this woman too that you know told dr kwan that she was going to take her life away because she just couldn't you know live in that situation but when she looked down at her dog she said who's going to feed you tomorrow so she didn't take her life and it's actually and, it's actually <laughs> illegal to take the dog away from them yeah they're mm -hmm. legally owners you, you can't just go up to the dog and take it um, number one, that can prompt some pretty intense violence because the animals are really important to a lot of these guys. For some of them, they're money mm -hmm. makers, you know. But yes. but it's yes. most of the most of the ones that that I've interacted with, the dogs are a route for sanity for them. They keep them using less drugs. They keep them doing less crime. They keep them safe and warm at night. That's actually a a, a big thing because a lot of these larger dogs that 35 pound 40 pound ones actually sleep right next to the person so they're they're hugely impo important and and to just go up and like snare the dog and take it away from the person is wildly emotionally traumatic for the person and not necessarily better for the dog there are legal things if the dog's not taken care of but now instead of having to rely on the police which unfortunately can't do much for us at all here in los angeles love the police, but their hands are tied in a lot of instances. And we really need to evolve things that are not like criminal law enforcement. This is a po point for the community. You can go out and help the person, get them resources that are available, um, reinforce that human animal bond, improve the survival of both the pet, the person and the community that they're in. And I just, I, I think that's that same thing I say all the time, but that's what love does. And thank you for doing that. Yeah, that's, that's so something true. that needs to be talked about more. And it is something that's not black and white and it's not obvious, but this is, a, you know, these are people that are stuck in a hard spot and, and the environment around them is dark, um, not in the literal sense, but it can seem bleak. And every second you get to practice love, it, it kind of pushes that back a little bit. And that's what animals are for, I mean, for me, mm -hmm. they're an opportunity to practice love. It, and, and that's they, very they, true. They, that's that's very true and we do look we do look out to see if we do see you know a pet owner that is probably using their you know their pit bull or dog to make money to sell uh we we look into that and sometimes owners of the unhoused like hector's a big one he's like oh you know my neighbor we call each other neighbors too um <laughs> they just found this dog and you know so we do welfare welfare checks as well there's other rescue groups that you know, go out and say like, hey, do you need a home for this dog? Or they see that there's dogs that are not being treated well. Um, they go and, you know, provide help for that. So we do look, we do look for that too. But uh, the love too, as you were saying, it, it's, it's great. You know, I would do anything for pickles. And, you know, if it, I hope this never happens. If I have to live out in the streets, I would take pickles with me or if I was living out in the streets and there was a choice between leaving her in the pound, I wouldn't do that. I, I have to take care of my dog. Or, well, know, that, Genesis, that brings up a, a question that I've had, which is how the, the laws are different in every city around the country, unfortunately, or fortunately, and having a pet is often the reason people become unhoused because they can't get housing. They can't rent a place that allows them to have their pet with them. So then rehousing the unhoused must be a challenge when they have pets with them. Is that 
being addressed? How is how are you all addressing that issue? That is the hardest part because we do run into that a lot. I remember a gentleman we ran into in Venice. He was living behind a Thai restaurant and we went up to him. We were speaking to the gentleman. He had a dog with a deformity of his leg. So we asked him, you know, if he needed help, we examined the dog full exam. And we always ask how they get, you know, into the situation. And Tonio is from Brazil. He speaks seven languages. He's very smart. He is a chef. And where he was living in an apartment in Venice, uh, the owner sold it so that they could build, you know, more apartments. But because he had no credit and he's from Brazil and he had the breed that he had of dog, is um, a Mastiff and a bigger dog versus someone like Pickles, uh, someone, someone, she's my human little baby, a pet like Pickles, they weren't taking him in because he had a large dog, the breed and no credit. So that situation where he's like, this is my baby. I, I was there when he was born. I can't let go of him. So he's living in the tent for that situation. So I'm hoping in the future that we find mo more homes that are willing to take large breed dogs because not everybody has a small breed dog or a cat, but that's something that we run to in LA and um, as well as sometimes if uh, the unhoused is in a location where they're not supposed to be by the city, they have to leave. And if they're not out by a certain time, some of them, and I hate saying this, go to jail and then the dog's taken to the pound or the pet. Mm. Mm -hmm. So then that's when we have situations when a pet owner is asking for money because there's a fee to get a dog out of the pound where they have to pay that fee. And that I, I think the irony that, that there are so many, you know, animals that end up in the shelter because people say, oh, you know what? I'm moving in with my boyfriend and he doesn't want the cats or, you know, the, the place where I'm moving doesn't take large dogs. I mean, I think in, in many ways, this is the crux of what has to be addressed because, I mean, I would be, I've got three cats, three dogs and four horses. It would be a big city block that I would need, but I would do it. <laughs> yes, but it's, it's um, that's why education on what we do is so important and getting the word out as well. And our whole big, you know, mission and our motto is just no judgment, just help and to trust that the money they're asking for or food is directly for their pet because it's it's the love and the bond that um, they have with this pet and their bonds a lot. You know, I love pickles to death, but I, I, you know, they're like I said before, they're together every single day, every mm -hmm. single night and they're and each other's blanket. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the, also just how ironic it is that we're saying, oh, well, are they giving them a good life? You know, well, what is your dog getting when you go to work every day? I right. mean, yeah. we have to, but it's like there's there's just such a, yeah, obviously I'm very passionate about this. Mm. I think your work is really filling a need to have a, a deeper conversation that I don't think a lot of people can even comprehend. I know that in the short time that I worked with the unhoused that it was hard for me to even get around the concept of creating that bridge. And one of the things that changed my mind was when I, uh, we used to bring food and it was a youth organization that did this, but I remember bringing my best cupcake and it was the best thing I make. I, people have called it the world peace cupcake and a guy that I'd been serving. <laughs> it's true. It's truly, truly delicious. The guy that I'd been serving for six months turned to me and looked me in the eye like, you didn't just pick this up from Costco in the back. This is legit. And then he told me his name. But it was a complex situation. I didn't understand. I think a lot of people that are listening to you, Genesis, would love to help and have that connection. But I will wholeheartedly endorse the fact that you're when you're working with people's animals, that's the closest bridge that you'll get mm -hmm. to creating that bond. And I, I think a lot of people would love to help you. We're so glad to spread the word. Um, yeah, it, it, legit. Like this, this touches me because I know how hard it is to get to that person and to see them as more than just a problem. And it's 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 hard for anybody to understand that. But pets are that bridge, 
And thank you for saying that about, you know, I hang on to mine like a lifeline for sure. And that's a, a way to see yourself in the mix of humanity, a totally different picture. Yeah. And what you said about Dr. Kwan really echoes um, what you're bringing up here about food. You know, and it, it was the cupcake, the homemade cupcake that made a difference. For Dr. Kwan, it was seeing the unhoused feeding most of his sandwich to his dog. Therefore, when I mostly, I'm, it's not in my area um, and just, I'm not seeing people unhoused with pets that often. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I am bringing, you know, I'll suggest, I'll ask food. What would you like me to get you at the grocery store kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And the other question I could ask is, do you have people that you are neighbors of yours who have pets? So I could just expand it that little bit to include pets in it, or do you have a pet somewhere? When people who are unhoused are going to places that are serving food, where they get to go inside and have a wonderful meal. I love the community churches where it's a meal for everybody. Pay if you can, if you can't pay, don't pay. There are restaurants around the world that one day a week open their doors to everybody. And so what do they do with their companion animals when they're going inside to eat? Are they, are any of the, is any accommodation being made for their animals or does that prevent them from getting that kind of great meal? Um, I, I smile when you're asking me this because they support each other a lot. You know, we're hoping that there's, there's a lot of facilities that do allow them to uh, bring their pet in. Oh, but good. the community in their neighborhood, they all support each other and they um, they have babysitters. So if someone does have oh. a job, a part time job or trying to um, start a life to get a job to get a house, uh, their neighbor will babysit for them. So that's oh. how they help each other out. They'll bring each other food. There's um, I'm not sure if you guys have um, heard about the brown bag lady. She's also in Skid Row and she will have you know, a whole street fair is what we call it. It will pop up and everyone in the community loves her. She'll, she'll bring, and we collabed with her. She'll bring food and it's warm food. It's just not, you know, sandwiches. She, they're, they're cooking, you know, chili dogs, you, you name it, hamburgers. Um, but they, they help each other out in, in the community or this. They like, Hey, there's someone down the street that needs help. And they, they all support each other. They're a community that understands what they're, the situation that they're in and and they they help their support for each other as well. Um, and, you know, something, you know, I f always forget to mention that I, I wanna share is, and why I'm so big and just not judging is to, it, it takes a lot for someone to ask, ask for money. You, you gotta let mm -hmm. go of your pride. And I've put myself in a situation where and I did this because I was in this, you know, uh, retreat of, you know, mastering transformation, you know, spiritual retreat. And my girlfriend had to dress as a homeless person and ask for money. And it's kind of a challenge to see if what you're willing to do for yourself. And she did come up to me and I looked at her and all I saw was a cigarette in her hand and Uggs and I didn't give her money. And as she walked away, I'm like, oh, my God, that's Jenna. So I then did it and I dressed, you know, not too clean and I'm just walking around and it's the hardest thing to go up to someone and ask for money. It, it, you got to let go of your, your ego and it eats up your pride and it's embarrassment. Uh, so this is why it's just, you see someone that needs support, even if someone doesn't have a dog, you know, if I have a few money, or if I'm by a market, I'll buy them food because, you know, if one day you guys are willing to try it just to go out in the streets and or stand in front of a 7-Eleven and ask for money, that is such a hard thing to do. It's not easy. So I had a, you know, here. so uh, I'm sorry. So, no. so, so many people right now are, are being bombarded by political requests and 
people are asking us to send our money so we can get somebody voted in to maybe hopefully do something that we want. Um, and maybe in a lot of instances we're better served to just help people directly and, and to use groups like yours that are really helping people and maybe spend less of the billions of dollars to get one person in a chair that might do something versus spend a tenth of a billion dollars to help people right in front of you. I, I just can't, I just can't uh, 100%. get away from that right now. We're spending billions and billions of dollars for a TV commercial that says I might do something one day. And that's why we thank you, Genesis. You're obviously doing something very real that's very near and dear to all of our hearts. So thank you for helping us raise our animal IQ and our people IQ and bringing light to this incredible work. And thank you to our panel for this amazing show. Genesis, nice. how can people help? We need to know how can anybody help or how can people get in touch with you? Uh, projectstreetvet.org is where we can get donations or if you wish to volunteer, uh, there's an application you can fill out and volunteer. Also through social media, I get a lot of people on Instagram again that reach out to me and say, hey, we found this pet or can I volunteer? And sometimes I'll just have, you know, people that come and help me when I go to Skid Row and they help. But projectstreetvet.org is where you could get more information on our mission, what we do, how you could support us. And that's just... Um, Project Street Red's the way to go if you want to give donations to help a pet. And again, it's just we do it all from simple, you know, uh, vaccines, flea and tick control to any surgery that this pet might need. And spay and neutering, that's, that's important too. We really appreciate your comprehensive look at this. And again, if you'd like to be a part of this uh, at home, it, a part of this conversation, you can email your questions to our website. Thank you so much, Genesis, and please give her best to Dr. Kwan. I will. I'll, I'll thank him. He says hello to all of you guys, and thank you for this opportunity because, again, you guys also help us spread the word. And we look forward to it being and continuing to be a nationwide organization. Today's show reminds me of a quote from the book, Animals Make Us Human. Animals can benefit greatly from human empathy and compassion, and in turn, they have a way of filling our heart without even trying. We'll see you again soon. Until then, love your pets. Medical information obtained from our website or the live show is not intended to be a substitute for professional care. If your pet has or you suspect they might have an illness or other medical condition, you should consult a health care provider. The opinions expressed on this TV program are not necessarily those of Smart Pet Talk this TV show or their sponsors. For all questions or info on sponsorship, email us at info at smartpettalk.com or visit our website at smartpettalk.com.